In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, have your way in this service, I pray. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, amen. That was a lot of prayer requests, so <laughs> worship with Dan. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. God is my refuge and my strength. Praise you, Jesus.
to your name. Let's take up this evening's offering with Fill My Way With Love. Praise you, Jesus. Let me walk, bless the Lord, in the way that was born, leading straight to the land of love. throw up uh, the announcements for tonight because uh, I don't have them in front of me. There we go. Upcoming events. We've got uh, the Renfrew service tonight. We'll pray over that uh, just in a second whenever we open up uh, for our preaching here this evening. So we'll, that is tonight. We've got a youth event, November 10th, DDH. That is at 7 p.m. November 12th. Uh, that is next Sunday is our Unity Sunday. And so uh, there's going to be not necessarily a, a, a Sunday night service here, uh, you're supposed to go out and fellowship and have your Sunday night service as a fellowship with somebody in the church. So make sure to plan that out. If, if you're smart, going to plan that out. Uh, if you haven't already, use the rest of the week to plan that out of who you are going to fellowship and visit with, uh, who you are going to break bread with. November 18th, men's breakfast. November 24th is ladies' Christmas dinner. And if you are a a part of Hyphen, uh, I will be making uh, the announcement for our Hyphen event this month very soon in the chat. Okay, 
Let's get to tonight. That is all of your announcements. Let's get to uh, the preaching. We are going to go to Mark chapter 5. You can go ahead and throw up the very first verse, Mark chapter 5. Five. It is verse 27, and I'm really just interested in those first five words. It says, when she heard about Jesus. When she heard about Jesus. Amen. Uh, let's pray over this service and the Renfrew service right now. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you are doing. Lord, we thank you for the way that you are moving in this community, God. And we thank you, Jesus, that we're not just here tonight, but we're also elsewhere, God, sharing your gospel, sharing your word. I pray, Jesus, that your word goes forth uh, in both services here tonight. Be with me tonight, Lord God. Be with Pastor tonight. Have your hand upon both of us. Anoint both of us, Lord God. Let your spirit fall everywhere in this valley, Lord, in the Ottawa Valley, we pray the outpouring of your spirit. Be with us. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Mark chapter 5, um, that is the intro verse. And we're, if you've been around uh, me speaking for long enough, you, you know that I kind of just kind of tell stories from the Bible and we just go through that. So Mark chapter 5 is, is where we're going from. At the beginning of the chapter, we see that Jesus has come from just across the water. In fact, he has just healed the demoniac. That is a pretty kind of famous thing that happens and that gets preached about uh, quite often, and well, tonight's sermon is not really from a, a topic that gets less preached about. It's, it's very well knowable, but Jesus comes across the water from healing a demoniac, and it, we are told at the beginning of Mark chapter 5 that a lot of people come and surround Jesus basically as he arrives. Uh, I don't know how he arrives, if there was docks or he just pulled up to the beach. I don't know, but however he pulled up to this next town, we know that a whole lot of people instantly surround him. And, and one of the people that immediately finds him as he lands in his next destination, in his next ministry stop. One of the people that immediately finds him is one of the rulers from the synagogue, and his name is Jairus, we are told. And Jairus comes to Jesus, and he falls at his feet. Why does he fall at his feet? Because he is in a desperate situation. He, we have, you know, a man who is the ruler of, of the synagogue, so he is somebody with great authority. He has great sa uh, status within the community, and here he is. He is falling at the feet of Jesus. He is showing that he is desperate. He is showing uh, humility. He is showing submission in this action, and he begins to essentially uh, beg at Jesus, uh, beg to Jesus. He's saying, please, Jesus, my daughter is at the point of death. Please just, could you just, could you just come? And I know if you just lay your hand on her, everything will be okay. And I, I know if you just, if you just lay your hand on her, she will be healed and, and she will live. Please, Jesus, just come and, and just see my daughter. Help me in this situation. And so Jesus agrees that, okay, Jairus, yeah, I'm going to come and I'm going to help you. And so they begin their journey to to Jairus's house. Now, there was already a very big crowd surrounding Jesus. As soon as he stepped off the boat, they're like, okay, Jesus has landed. Everybody out to the docks, out to the beach. He's here. Jesus is here. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of anticipation. But now we have a verbal agreement between Jesus and Jairus that Jesus is going to go and heal Jairus's daughter. So there is knowledge and there is also an expectation to everybody present that they are about to see in their minds, they think they're going to see a public miracle. They have a verbal agreement between Jesus and Jairus that Jesus is going to heal Jairus' daughter. And so everybody is like, wow, this is fantastic. We get to see it. Let's follow. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Let's see what the result is. And we are told that Jairus' daughter is at death's door. And so Jesus has agreed to go and heal her. And this is really what the crowds wanted. They wanted public signs. They, they asked Jesus multiple times, give us a, a public sign from heaven. Perform a public sign from heaven to signify that you are the Christ, that you are the Messiah. And, and public signs, they, it, it you know, increased uh, notoriety increased his fame throughout the region. So they wanted to see uh, spectacles. They wanted to be uh, s visible participants of miracles. They wanted to be fascinated and wowed. And uh, to be honest, who wouldn't? 
right? If, if you, if Jesus was going down the street and you're like, hey, what's, and there's a crowd around him, you're like, hey, what's going on? And, he, and the response is, he's going to heal somebody. Are you not going to join in? No, of course you're going to join in. You want to see Jesus do something. That's exciting. That's, that's awesome. So who wouldn't want to see Jesus uh, perform a miracle? Of course you would. So uh, you want to see the impossible happen. We have a verbal guarantee that the impossible is going to happen. So everybody is ready, and there, there's an energy of anticipation. There's a, a, an excitement. There's an energy of excitement. We're going to see something happen here. So we're told at the beginning of Mark chapter 5, Jesus steps off the boat, and a big crowd surrounds him. But we are given an update uh, post-Jesus Jairus agreement that the crowd kind of grows and gets a little bit more unruly. And they get a little bit of unruly because of the excitement that they have. They're, they're just, they're just, they can't contain themselves. They can't hold still. And so we are told with the update of the crowd that the crowd now has enlarged in number and they're, they've, they're, you know, they got that excitement energy. They're moving, they're, they're grooving around. And, and we are told that the crowd is pressing from all sides. From all sides. So even as Jesus and Jairus are trying to make forward progress, there's people in front of them restricting them almost from, from going forward too quickly. So they're being jostled from the left and from the right. They're being pushed from behind. And even in front of them, it is hard for them to make progress. Why? Because there is an energy. There is uh, an anticipation, an excitement. And so the crowd, you know, it's still a good crowd. It's not a mob, but they're kind of disorderly now. And so we are given this description of the scene of public anticipation for what is assumed is going to be a public miracle. And then the narrative just kind of takes like a, a, a pause or, or a time out. We get a, a break in the push and the shove of the crowd, and we are instead kind of diverted and told of a woman who has an issue of blood for, for 12 years. In the midst of kind of this public anticipation, it's, it's like a, it's a timeout's called, and then we get told about this private need. And so this woman has been suffering for, for 12 years. And, and when we, you know, think about it, if we're trying to plant ourselves within the narrative, if we're trying to plant ourselves within the story, and we really start thinking and processing what's going on here, 12 years is, is a very long time to be continuously, every single day, not well. That is a long, long time to every single day be suffering. And, uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 26, if you go there, it, it tells you that she had suffered a lot of different things from a lot of different people. She had suffered from a lot of physicians, a lot of doctors, and I can't uh, imagine, I don't have the knowledge of all that she suffered, but I can imagine that uh, a lot of it was not pleasant. She, she suffered. It's telling us it, it was not pleasant. It was not nice. Some of these treatments that the doctors told her to do, it, it was painful. It was, it was an awful time of life. And, and not only that, but in her uh, search to try and find a solution and try and cure herself, try and cure this disease, try and find a solution for her problem, in doing this, we are told that she had spent every single dollar that she had. She had put all of the money, all of the wealth that she had. I don't know if she even uh, maybe sold some personal possessions to try and seek continued treatment. But we're told she spent everything that she had. And every time she spent more money, things never got better. In fact, every time she went to the doctor, she came out worse. How miserable of an existence is that, that for 12 years you, you work, you know, nine to five, five, six days a week, and then, and then on, you know, your seventh day a week, you go to the doctors and you spend all of your hard-earned money and you just walk away in a worse state than what you were in last week. That's a miserable, miserable existence. Can, you, 
right? If, if we're trying to get into the story, imagine the hopelessness that she must be feeling and the desperation that she has that, you know, every time she's offered just a sliver, a little bit of light that maybe uh, this doctor's treatment worked for this person. And so it's a sliver of light. It's a sliver of, of, of hope. And so she goes to this certain physician over here, but but they don't help. But okay, this this methodology worked over here on, on the west side of the town. So she, she makes the day's journey over there. And and again, she just keeps continually leaving every single situation worse than what she began with. And and what determination she shows to continually push on and continually seek treatment, even though she continually gets worse. And so the result of seeking help was that her life kept getting worse. And then we're told in verse 27 and this is this is the pivoting moment in the story it says when she heard about Jesus when she heard about Jesus now i'm not exactly sure when she heard about Jesus we're not really told when but i'm assuming it's it's quite clearly after she spent her last penny it's after she spent her last dollar. I, I think it's safe to say that she heard of Jesus after the last doctor's appointment that she could afford. She's done. She's out of money. She heard of Jesus after this. I, I think that's maybe safe to assume. Was it, when did she hear, hear about Jesus? Was it, you know, several days prior to his arrival? Did the town know that he was coming? I, I, I don't know. I can't tell you that. Was it, you know, as, as the crowd walked through the town and, and as the, she heard, you know, the, the noise of the crowd, maybe before she saw the crowd, but then, you know, she sees the crowd coming down the street and it kind of looked looks like a rowdy mob making its way down the street. But, but maybe it was as the people moved closer and closer that she realized this isn't a mob and this isn't a riot and, and it's okay, I'm safe because these people are actually happy and, and they're excited and they got smiles on their faces and the energy that they're giving off is, is very positive. And so she kind of moves maybe to the, to the side of the street to get out of the way of the hustle and bustle of the crowd because they're going and they're, they're moving somewhere. And so she gets out also because she is unclean, so she is not supposed to touch anybody because anybody that she touches, they will also be unclean. And there's some negative results that uh, things you have to do whenever you are declared unclean. You have to remove yourself from society for a little, bo- a little bit. So she moves to the side of the street and, and maybe the crowd's passing by and maybe she throws out the question, you know, hey, uh, what's happening? What's, what's going on here? Where are you all going and why are you all so happy? And, and somebody just shouts, Jesus! <laughs> well, who's Jesus? Who, who is this guy? And maybe somebody else from the crowd responds, oh, Jesus, he's the Messiah. He, he's in the middle here somewhere over, over there. And, well, he's the Messiah. How do you know he's the Messiah? Well, somebody else maybe responds, he, he just came across the, the water where he cast a legion, a whole legion of demons out of a single person, and now he's on his way to heal Jairus' daughter right now. And we're told when she hears about Jesus and who he was and what he was doing that she decided that this was her moment. She, she had spent all of her money, all of her time trying to be healed, but in that moment she realized that she had more than a last ditch effort because if he's really the Messiah then he can actually heal her he can actually provide her with hope that is going to result in a positive outcome and so we're told verse 27 when she hears about Jesus she knows and she decides in her mind this is her time this is her shot this is her one moment her opportunity where everything in her life can change when she hears about Jesus is on his way to heal someone she decides she's going to make that somebody herself when she hears about Jesus, we're told she begins to push from the back of the crowd. It's, it's after the crowd passes. It's, it's after they're, they're there. She, she maybe gets that confirmation of who Jesus is and, and what he's doing. So she begins to push and to shove her way in from the back of the crowd. And many people are already pushing forward. They're excited. They are anxious to see the miracle. But the difference between the crowd and this woman is that this woman is anxious to be 
the miracle. Everybody else just wanted to see, but this woman is desperate to receive. And that's the common thread. That's the commonality between Jairus and this woman. They were the people who got desperate enough to be involved in the ministry of Jesus and not just look at it. See, a whole lot of people just wanted to see miracles. They were satisfied with just visibly being wowed. A whole lot of people would follow Jesus from town to town. Why? Because it was exciting. It was the happening thing to do. It, it, he, you know, he performed some cool magic tricks now and then. It was a cool road traveling show and, and you got free food sometimes. So that was kind of a cool side bonus. But a whole lot of people, they just wanted to see miracles being done. But Jairus and the woman were different from the crowd because they wanted to actually receive what Jesus could do. They didn't want to simply be some spectator who could stand in awe, but they wanted to be someone who was transformed by the power of God. See, many people were were pushing in the crowd, but she pushed harder because she was desperate. She was desperate to have life change, and she would have had to shove her way through this crowd, and it was pressing, and it was jostling, and it was not easy to get to Jesus. She had to press through more. You, you know, you, you would imagine that her desire would be an easy route to Jesus. She's already pressed through 12 years of her life of suffering. Why does she have to press through more? I don't know. I don't have the answer, but that's just kind of how God works sometimes. You got to press through a little bit more to get to Jesus. You got to press through a little bit more to get the miracle or to get the healing or whatever you need from Jesus. You got to press through a little bit more. So she presses through the crowd and it's not easy. That final press, that final push is not easy, but she determines as she continues to get closer and closer to Jesus, she determines in her mind, I just got to touch the hem of his garment. I just got to touch his clothes. If I can just touch his garment, I know I will be made whole. If he's going to heal anybody today, I'm going to make it me. And so she reaches out and she makes contact with the clothes of Jesus. And it's, we are told she is immediately made whole. She is immediately healed. It, it is the transformation in a millisecond. She reaches out and she gets the hem of Jesus's garment and immediately the fountain of her blood is dried up in that very second. She could feel the healing process. Sometimes we've heard from miracle surfaces, it's like a fire burning through the body. She could feel the healing miracle pass through her body and be complete. And so Jesus, trying to make his way through the crowd, he, he, he stops and, you know, the crowd almost tramples him because they were, they're not expecting him to stop. And they, they push him forward and, and, he, and he turns around and he says, who touched my clothes? And the disciples, they don't understand Jesus. They're like, uh, dude, what? What do you mean who touched your clothes, like, are you oblivious to the fact that we've barely been able to walk for the last 20 minutes because of the press of the crowd? It's, it's jostling, it's bumping. Like, Jesus, how zoned out are you? Do, you, do are, Were you, like, present while we were walking? Do you know what's going on? Probably everybody within a 20-meter radius touched your clothes. So specify a better question, please. And as his disciples are being very sarcastic to him, Jesus is scanning the crowd and he's looking for the woman and he makes eye contact with the woman who is now healed. And the woman, she is afraid. She doesn't know what's going to happen now because there's a, a sudden bunch of realizations that are going through her mind. First of all, she just touched everybody in the crowd in an unclean state. There's a lot of fear that is coursing through her. She's, she's shaking. The Bible tells us she's shaking and she takes a couple steps forward and she falls to the ground and she tells Jesus what has happened in her life and she's she's probably weeping from joy and just from so much emotion telling Jesus all that she has lived through and what she has suffered through and all of the solutions that she has tried and and now she's healed and now all of that is over why because she just touched the hem of his garment and she could feel the healing flow through her body and as she she tells Jesus Jesus, what happened? Jesus responds, daughter, your, your faith has made you 
whole. It's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful moment. Go in peace. You're healed. Go in, in peace. You are well. The impact that those words would have had on her, you, you would not know unless you were her. Go in peace. You haven't had peace for the last 12 years of your life. Not one day from those last 12 years have you known peace, but now go and walk in that peace. Live in that peace that God has given to you. Go and be healed. Walk in your healing. Walk in the peace and the joy of God. And so it's an incredible, incredible moment. It's a, it's a moment of a complete and total life change. It's, it's an incredible healing uh, in that moment. And, you know, if you're in the crowd, your, your mind is blown. It's like, whoa, we, we weren't even expecting this. But there's a whole lot of things that are packed into this moment. Because while this woman has been healed, there's also some other odd things at work in this, in this very moment. See, uh, there is, we already know, quite a crowd surrounding the scene. There are many, many onlookers that have just seen what have happened. And while they may not completely understand it, they get the gist. Uh, this woman touched Jesus, and now she's healed. So, you know, those who weren't standing so close, they get it. You know, word travels through the crowd. And so she's healed. And I'll, I'll say this first, and then we'll continue explaining the moment. It's curious to me that nobody cries out, hey, heal me too. It, it, it kind of strikes me funny that this woman is healed and nobody's like, yeah, I, I, I need something done for me too. I, I could use the same thing. I need the same thing for me, or, or I know a friend, Jesus, if, if you don't mind, it's just like five minutes. It, it's not going to take you too far off the route to Jairus' house, but, but I need something too. Nobody says anything. The woman with the issue of blood, she's, she's healed. Jesus confirms it. And everybody is fine with just watching. Now, Again, I do have to admit and be honest, I don't know everything that's going on in this moment because I'm not there. I, I can read about it uh, from Mark. I can read about it from Matthew, from Luke. There, there's different accounts that help kind of shape different perspectives a little bit, but that's all I can get. I can only get what I can read. So I, I will be honest, I don't understand completely the mood and the feeling and everything uh, that is happening. I, I, I try and dig as much as I can out of the scriptures. I, I, don't have, I can't get any more than that. However, it, it, it's just weird to me that nobody raises their hand and says, Hey, Jesus, just take a couple seconds and can I touch your garment too? Can I, can I touch the hem of your, your garment too? Right? I mean, if we went around here tonight, it, it would take a little bit because I, I, am, I, I feel like I could 99% guarantee every single buddy, every single person here knows at least two people who have a need in their life. And I'm going to make, I think, a very safe assumption that there's a whole lot more people present in the crowd than there are here tonight. There's a lot of people there. There's a lot of needs there. And everybody is fine with just watching. Everybody is fine with just, with just seeing. And I don't get it. Why is the crowd only being a crowd? Why would the majority of people, why would 99.7% of people rather just watch than take part in the healing that is available in that moment. I don't get it. But also on the same hand, I've probably done it myself. Because there's so many reasons why we prefer to be part of the crowd and just watch. It's probably because we don't like to be so vulnerable as the person who we just saw was. It's probably because sometimes we're not ready to be fully honest in that moment. 
we don't want to admit perhaps to ourselves or at least publicly that we're hurt or that we need healing because we're sick. And sometimes it's because they and, and we downplay our need. Well, I'm not as sick as that person, so uh, maybe the altar call is just for extreme cases here tonight. Sometimes we don't want to be viewed as, as desperate as that person. It's like we relegate them to a lower status because they had a need. They need more healing than, than I do. I don't want to be viewed as, as lower. So we just kind of stay in the crowd. Sometimes it's, you know, I, I haven't been suffering for 12 years, so, so I don't think it's the appropriate time to speak up. My problem isn't, it's not that big, so I'll, I'll give other people the opportunity. It's their chance tonight. But I just feel like in that crowd, there was a whole lot more needs than just Jairus' daughter. There's a massive of amount of people there, and, and it would have made an extraordinary list if each of them took the time to say, hey, Jesus, if you could operate in all of these things, that'd be great. It would be an endless list. But nobody seizes the moment. They would rather watch than be participants of God's healing. That's one thing that's happening in, in that moment. It's a, right, I said it's a complex moment. So that's one thing that's happening in that moment. They would rather watch than participate. But there's also something else that's happening in this moment that we're told about. See, as this woman is healed and faith it begins to rise. That's just the natural response. A miracle is performed. God has moved. So your faith begins to rise. Wow, he really can do it, right? Maybe before they only heard stories about Jesus, but now we have a personal confirmation. So faith begins to rise in that one second. Wow, look what happened. The woman, she just, she just simply touched his clothes and she was healed. But the next thing that's also happening in that moment is somebody kind of works their way into the crowd and it's a servant from Jairus' house. And the servant from Jairus' house tells Jairus, hey, don't ask Jesus anything because your daughter is dead. We're told that it's as Jesus is still speaking to the woman that the servant comes in and enters the scene. So I, I said it's a complex moment. Faith is both rising and crashing in the same minute. Right? This woman is healed. Jairus, just come back home and don't bother him anymore. And because this news of Jairus' daughter is delivered in that exact moment, maybe that's why nobody speaks up. I can't confirm anything 100%, but we also have to recognize that this isn't an isolated incident. Time after time, when people are healed, the crowd is just fine to watch. If you're reading through the Gospels, if you're you know, on your, your Bible plan and you're reading chronologically, you've, you've read through all the Gospels now. You've read through them all. And so you know time after time when people get healed, nobody speaks up and says, hey, I need something too. They're just fine with watching. They're fine with being a crowd. See, the crowd got to see the public miracle, but they didn't want to be an actual participant. It was, it was a step too many for almost everybody there. They got to see a public miracle, although it, it wasn't the one they were expecting. In fact, the public miracle that they got to see, it wasn't the one that they were following Jesus for. It wasn't the reason why they were following Jesus. The reason why they were following Jesus in that moment is because they were going to see Jairus' daughter healed. But now we've got a very complicated situation because the reason I'm following Jesus seems to have collapsed. It's very cool that we got the side bonus of this public miracle that the woman with the issue of blood is healed. But now I've got private problematic questions because the very reason I am following Jesus has crumbled. They were expecting Jesus to heal Jairus' daughter, but all the hope that they had of that positive result, all that excitement, all of that anticipation that they were carrying as they, you know, smiled and laughed and ran down the street to Jairus' house, all of that has crumbled 
because it seems like that is a dead end and it's not possible to be worked out or performed. It's over. That reason is dead. The reason why they were following Jesus is now dead. He did this thing, but the reason why I'm following him, the very hope that I'm clinging on to has completely crashed. And so the hope that I had is gone now. The thing I was anticipating to happen, it's not going to happen anymore. So I guess this is the end of the road for me. The crowd got their public miracle, even though it wasn't the one they were expecting. But they weren't ready for the challenge. They weren't ready to take on the challenge of the private matters of the heart. Because the private matters of the heart was saying, the reason I'm following Jesus is now dead. The private matter of the heart is, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Let's not trouble Jesus anymore. And so the mood of the crowd, it shifts in an instant. And maybe there were people in the crowd who, upon seeing the woman healed, were ready to say, Jesus, I I need the same thing. I, I need healing too. Maybe there were some sick people in the crowd who wanted to touch the hem of Jesus's garment. And maybe there were some people who wanted to speak up and be participants, but the mood shifts so suddenly because expectations are not met. And Jairus' daughter is dead. It, it, you know, in the crowd, feet start to shift in the dust of the street because Jairus' daughter is dead. It, it's awkward. People are kind of standing there. and They don't know exactly what to do. The mood is changing. The atmosphere is changing. Uh, faith, instead of going on that increase because somebody's healed, it's now vanishing. Belief is failing. And Jesus looks at Jairus and he senses the mood of the crowd. He knows exactly what's going on. And that's why he says to Jairus, don't be afraid just believe. Don't be afraid. Don't submit to the fear that everybody else is falling prey to right now. Don't be afraid. Press on. Believe. He doesn't let anybody come with him from this point forward. Only uh, Jairus, Peter, James, and John are allowed to follow him from this point forward. And Jesus goes and he heals Jairus's daughter And what everybody was expecting to be a public miracle, Jesus handles in private. Jesus, he he doesn't, he rarely does things as we expect him to. We build up, uh, Brother Pio talked about it this morning, we build up expectations in our mind of everything, of every kind of thing that we go through. Sometimes it's good expectations. I'm going to be healed this certain way. Sometimes it's bad expectations. Like Brother Pio said, the doctor called me, my Lord, I must be dying. And a lot of times, actually, we're disappointed in the way that God does things. Because it's not like we planned them out. It's not like we expected them to be. We have a great rise of faith. Things are done. God, God moves. But like the crowd that day, something negative happens, and our faith just suddenly vanishes. And we've probably, all of us, if we're going to be honest, have likely missed out on opportunities for God to change our lives because, like the crowd, we were afraid. We didn't have enough faith in that moment. It didn't feel like the right time in the altar call. We didn't want to step out publicly and admit that that we had a need. We weren't desperate enough in that moment. We weren't ready to take the next step in our life, in our faith journey with God. I'm sure we've all missed out on something, very likely more than once. Someone else reaches out in faith, and God answers their prayer, and internally you think, you know, oh, God, I I need the same thing, but you weren't bold enough to step out in prayer like them, and and so you didn't receive it. You you missed out. That's, That's probably happened before. Or whenever you were trying to get filled with the Holy Ghost and, and somebody gets the Holy Ghost, but, but they were kind of weeping and crying too much. And so you're not a, you know, you need the Holy Ghost too, but you're not as desperate as them. You're not as big of a sinner as them. You don't want to cry as much as they did. So uh, I'll, I'll hold off till next service because I don't want to seem that low. We relegate. You know, my, one problem that I had, I'll, I'll be honest, I get emotional when I pray. I cry. So I didn't want to be seen as weak. 
I didn't want to be seen as highly emotional and weak as a, as a man, as a, as a man. I didn't want to be seen as weak and, and crying in the presence of God. That's something that held me back from getting the Holy Ghost. And so there were services where I wouldn't reach out as fully as I knew I should or could because I held myself back. And so then you live your life with disappointment that you did not act in that moment because you go home after service and you know within your heart of hearts you could have got something that night. You could have got something that altar call and you didn't because you didn't step out and you were afraid and you held back. And the moments passed. A service like that, it hasn't happened again or maybe that preacher hasn't preached camp meet again. The, the moment passed and you have missed out. And so now because of your choice, you have to live with your need unmet. And you've been living, I don't know how long, but you've been living with your need unmet because you didn't step out and reach. You didn't press through that final press of the crowd. You submitted to the fear of the crowd. And so you've been living, and it seems like you have no options now. It seems that this is just your reality now. You missed your one chance from God. But that's not true. That's not true. In fact, you still have options. Option number one, you can keep going like you have been, and you can remain a part of the crowd and life goes on as always, and you do not get your, mean, your need met. That's the option that you've been going with. But you also have another option. And your other option is that you finally get to the point where you really want more. You finally get to the point where you're not afraid anymore to step out when God is passing by. You're not going to miss out again. You're frustrated enough. You are finally desperate enough that you are not going to miss out again. God did it for that person. You saw it. You were a part of the crowd. And so you've got to finally bring yourself to the point where you say, he can do it for me too. And this time, the next chance that I get, I am not going to miss out. And so maybe you have been waiting for Jesus once more. You know he can do it. And you've just been waiting for that opportunity to arise once more. But I, I, I'm here tonight to tell you, you don't have to wait any longer. Stir it up in yourself. Get into his presence and reach out in faith. You can feel God moving. God was moving this morning. There was an opportunity this morning. There's an opportunity every single service to see. Step out in the spirit of God and reach out in faith. See, the woman with the issue of blood, she was desperate enough to say to herself, Jesus is here right now. This is my greatest opportunity. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And there was people in the crowd that day who, like her, they had a need, but they didn't have the courage and they didn't have the faith right then and there to do the exact same thing that that woman did. But here's the thing, that story of the woman touching the hem of the garment, it got told. It got told around the city. It got told to neighboring cities and neighboring communities of how this woman was healed. And when Jesus went to his next stop, when Jesus went to the next town, people began to say, if she can do it, I can do it. Stop being held back by fear because your breakthrough can open up a door for other people to receive theirs as well. Other people heard her story and they said, if God can do it for her, then God can do it for me. And I want the exact same thing. People began to work themselves up in determination and in faith saying, God, you got to do the same thing for me. You've got to do the same thing for me. Word spread around about her healing and her miracle that this woman had received. And as word spread around through the neighborhoods and through the towns, there were people saying, hey, I need the same thing. I'm not going to be like the crowd that was there who was there and said, oh, yeah, I just saw it. No, I, I want healing, too, and, and I want deliverance, too. See, the people in the crowd that day, they missed out on an opportunity to interact and receive healing from God, whatever it is that they needed. And we ourselves have got to learn that when Jesus shows up and when he begins to move and when the Spirit Spirit starts moving, it's time to take part. 
We've got to learn it's time to take part. I've got to stop just sitting in my seat. I've got to get active. I feel the presence of God here. We can't just sit there and be spectators in our seat. We can't lie to ourselves and say, yeah, I was there, so therefore I was part of it. We can't lie to ourselves and and say, oh, yeah, I I, I saw her touch Jesus' garment. Man, it was good church today. Oh, yeah, I I saw it. I was in the crowd. It it was a good time. We sang some good songs after we heard God. God is so good. No, you weren't a part of the spirit and the move of God. You just saw it happen. You weren't a part in receiving something of God. You You just visibly were in awe at the presence of God and what was happening. You just said, wow, that's awesome. And so if anybody asked anybody in that crowd, hey, what did Jesus do for you? Surely you got Jesus to do it. He was right there. This is the guy we've been waiting for. What did you get him to do for you? Surely you had him to do something. And everybody in that crowd except Jairus and the woman would have had to say, Nah, I just watched. I just, I just watched. Nah, I, I didn't get him to do anything for me, but I had a great time watching. It was a great service. It was a great altar call. I I saw people being touched and and moved by God. Man, it was a, God was there today. He had a great presence, but I just watched. I just watched. No, when the spirit of God is moving, it's time for us to move. We usher them in with songs and we usher them in with praise and we feel them like we felt them this morning. It was strong and it was powerful. And when that happens, we've got to begin to react and we've got to throw out the schedule. We've got to throw out expectations and just submit to the spirit of God and begin to be active participants in what God is doing. We can't keep just watching God happen. We've got to be a part of of God happening. And that's what the end time church has got to be. We've got to be active participants. We've got to flow in God's spirit. We've got to be in it, acting with it, an active participant. We can't just watch God do end time ministry. We've got to do the end time ministry. We've got to pray and we've got to push through in praise and in the spirit. We can't just watch God happen. We've got to get it inside of ourselves. God, I've got to be a part of what's happening. I've got to be a part. Maybe I don't have a need, so I've got to stir up something in the spirit, and I've got to pray in tongues. I've got to get you to pray your perfect will through me. I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to pray for. Maybe I'm I'm perfect, and I don't have a need, so pray through the spirit, and let him move through you. Be an active participant. God, I can't stand here and just watch things. I've got to be a part of it. We've got to get that in our minds. I've got to be a part of it. When the spirit moves, we move. We've got to get that into our minds. When the spirit moves, I move. I'm not just going to sit on my chair any longer. I've got to be a part. Musicians, if you could come. See, the crowd was not yet ready. The crowd wasn't ready. But the woman who was healed from her issue of blood, she paved the way. And there was two things that happened. There's two things that we need to take away from this here today. The first thing is the one that I just went off of. Is whenever the presence of God moves, we've got to take advantage of that opportunity. We've got to stop missing out on the move of the Spirit. And if there isn't a move yet, we've got to praise Him and make one. We've got to start being active participants and ushering in the presence of God and taking part of the presence of God. So that's number one takeaway. Stop sitting, take part. Move. Don't be a watcher. Don't be the crowd who just sees and says, yeah, that was amazing. No, take part in it. So that's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two. This is to encourage you if you are the one with the need. Whenever you press through like that woman did, I said it before, but I haven't taken us completely there. Whenever you press through like that woman did, like Jairus did, you open up a doorway for everybody else. You make it easier for everybody else. How do I make it easier? That doesn't make any sense, you say. How how would me getting my miracle 
impact anybody else? Yeah, maybe it, it rises their faith, but how would I make it easier for other people to receive their healings and their miracles? How would that happen? I told you that news traveled. News traveled about this woman with the issue of blood, about how she reached out and how she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And at Jesus' next stop, Mark chapter 6, 53 to 56, at Jesus' next stop, it says they cross over and they come to the land of Gennesaret and they anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and they ran, they ran through the whole surrounding region and they began to carry the beds of those who were sick, that anybody who could just hear where he was, they would go to where he was, carrying the people on their beds, wherever he entered, if it was a village, a city or a country, and they laid the sick in the marketplaces and they begged him if you could just do the same for me if you could just do the same for me hey uh, Jesus I heard somebody got healed this way God I need the same healing Jesus uh, God I, I just believe like that woman did that day in the crowd Jesus if I can just touch the hem of your garment if I can just touch the hem of your garment if I can just touch if I can just be healed her story was told and it increased the faith of others around her of those not even in the same city of her but yet as people heard what she did it stirred them up to be more than a visitor a visible person from the crowd who just watches and who just sees but it stirred to say god i need the same thing god i i need the same thing this woman she opened up a doorway for other people to be healed we've got to start moving in the spirit we've got to be active participants of the spirit that is it i am done come to the altar and say god help me help me to stop being captive by fear and watching god help me to stop just watching what's going on yeah maybe i pray my little prayer but i don't step out yeah maybe other people get the holy ghost but i haven't gotten it yet because i'm a little too afraid god help me to get past the fear don't fear just believe god i've got to take advantage of every opportunity that i have to step into your spirit and allow your spirit to flow through me god i've got to take advantage because time is running short god i've got to stir up your presence i can't just be an onlooker god you are calling me to be an active participant you are calling me jesus to do your work and god i can't do it by just watching i've got to be involved i've got to be active god help me to get past my fear help me to get past my fear god my my healing is on the other side of my fear and, and my breakthrough is on the other side of my fear god other people's breakthrough through is on the other side of my fear. Help me stir myself up. Help me stir myself up.